And that's the only single thing that causes malignancy. That is the only thing that I have found so far over five years of studying possibly two to three thousand patients. All cancer. Yes. Uh, in 1998, when I was running for office with state representative, uh, not only was I probably extraordinarily fatigued, I had a sore throat, a continuous sore throat, started going to the doctor looking for some assistance and didn't get any, but realized there was something wrong. Um, eventually, that led to uh, having my lymph nodes uh, swelling, and uh, I went to a doctor, throat doctor, sometime in February, and he felt I might have lymphoma. Uh, at that point, I decided to go to one of the Boston hospitals. I felt if I was going to go and have an operation or have any kind of problem, I should go to the best. So I went up to Mass Eye and Ear. And uh, at that time, uh, after having a biopsy of the tongue, it was found to have a tumor in the back of the tongue. And uh, the operation they were proposing for me was pretty invasive. Yeah, I, I had second, third, and fourth, and fifth opinions. And I went on to uh, another another hospital in Dana Farber, and uh, spoke to the uh, leading directors of all of the departments at Dana Farber, which is a leading cancer hospital in, in Boston, probably one of the most famous in the world. And they too substantiated that I would need this very invasive operation, which would mean cutting part of my tongue. Um, and um, so it wasn't a very happy kind of situation that I was looking forward to. Then, um, approximately uh, three and a half weeks, I went in for a test. I had to go uh, for a preoperative test because I was still proceeding as if I would have the traditional operation. And uh, we went through the test, the CAT scan, all of the other operations. The day after the test, the doctor called me up and said the operation was not going to be necessary. And I said, why? And he said the tumor was gone. And I asked him what it was, and he said it was a miracle. Who was this that said it was a miracle? This was now a Dr. William Montgomery, who was the mass pioneer and who's world-renowned doctor, uh, who I had started working with, who seemed to be the most empathetic and understanding, and also the most accomplished in throat cancer. So what was his advice? His advice was keep doing whatever you've done and uh, keep the treatment going. I hope to actually encourage alternative medicine in the state of Massachusetts. I've also worked very hard to get other women and legislators to support this and sponsor it. And I think we're going to make great strides because what we need to do is give people an alternative choice prior to surgery, prior to radiation or chemotherapy. Because I've seen people have all of those and yet have tumors come back. Hi, my name is Mike McElroy. I'm a personal trainer and nutritional consultant here in Santa Monica, California. For the last five years, I've been using Dr. Hulda Clark's method for killing parasites and cleaning people's bodies of pollution. She's discovered that th those are the two things that cause cancer. She's also discovered that this is the cause to many diseases. In her new book, Cure to Advance Cancer, Dr. Clark will introduce you to the way that you can actually cure yourself or your loved ones. What we want you to do over this next few minutes is watch the specific doctors and scientists and patients explain to you how they cured themselves. And Dr. Clark explain the method in which she's discovered tumor formation as well as cancer. And you too will be fascinated as we were. Now with no further ado, Dr. Halda Clark. Every disease that I uh, saw in my office over a period of say 10 years had a dominant parasite involved. Remember, I was testing everybody 
for a set of parasites, about 70. I list all the parasites in the book, which ones I was testing for. And to my surprise, if you had diabetes, it would be urethrema, the pancreatic fluke. Pancreatic fluke. Diabetes is a disease of the pancreas. What about the, the fluke that you talked about, the fasciolopsis fluke? How did we get that into our body? It's in the meat and the dairy industry, except in kosher foods. We were just discovering that kosher food, and this will go into the book still, that kosher dairy products do not have these parasites, which shows you it's a matter of cleanliness. We now have all the people watching this squirming at home because they all think now, okay, I understand, I have parasites in my body, and we all do, according yes, to your of research. Yes, we do. So according to your research, you found that all humans have this, and as long as we're healthy, we're okay with it because the body can handle it. My next question to you is, how do we rid ourselves of these tenacious bacteria, parasites, and virus? Do you have an answer to that? The, the, the answer uh, that I came up with already in the first uh, books was the hull of the black walnut tree, but the hull has to be green. There is something in the green hull that kills everything I ever tested for which doesn't mean everything, <laughs> but let's say uh, close to 100 parasite varieties. So you're telling me that in all of our pharmacology, all the millions of dollars spent with research and cancer, the native Indians who were using this hundreds of years ago has already had the solution to cancer? Those who were, yes, but uh, I don't know how much lore, folklore, there is around this, this herbal product. And there are many other good herbal products out there. I'm sure there must be other things that can do the same thing. But you found but, this to be the best product. Yes, and now we have a freeze-dried product, which is even more potent than the alcohol extract uh, that, that we call a tincture. And the apparently freeze-drying preserves some extra elements so that you don't even really need the cloves and the wormwood with it. Now, not enough experiments have been done so that I can say you never need them. But a person can now use a freeze-dried variety and, and be saved the extra chore of taking so much cloves and wormwood. I started to be very, very interested in the relationship between parasites and the candida. So my first thing was I looked into the books from the clinics, uh, books on paras parasitology. And to my own surprise, when you read books on parasitology, they would say that on some of the parasites, the fungus live on the skin. That is known in the clinic. That is not something new. I read Dr. Clark's book and I see that she says the fungus could live in the parasite. So the thing do, does not really contradict itself, on the contrary. And that was the explanation because those people we could not get through with the fungus therapy, they had parasites and on those parasites they had fungus living. The, 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 the moment we uh, attacked the parasites with all the Clark, uh, the, the parasites, is exactly the moment we got through in the uh, fungus therapy. So from that moment on, I was very, very interested. <laughs> and I started to read all those uh, books. And then I got um, all the parasites I could get a hold of. Uh, and in the meantime, I have uh, more than 90 or 100 parasites. You could see, you could see all those. This is a kit I developed, which now in Germany is being uh, very popular. Um, especially in all people working with the BICOM. They test with this kit. There are more than 50 parasites in there, which are all the flukes um, and all the uh, uh, nematodes, all the testodes, all the... Uh, it is not enough. My experience is that it is not enough just to uh, treat the fluke. You all, the Fasciolopsis bulski, you also have to see all the stages and it is not allowed that any stages would be on any system left because if it does and the, the patient 
got better, but then uh, we saw that sometimes the uh, disease, the, the cancer can uh, start again. And when it started again, we found that again the buski has developed. So uh, we have to make sure that everything is out of his system and that the immune system is stabilized. So we have a relationship with two parasites and cancer, Clostridium bacteria yes. and the Fasciolopsis parasite, which you call the fluke. Yes. How did we get that? Uh, the Fasciolopsis larval parasite belongs to the malignant development. The Clostridium belongs to the premalignant or tumor growth part of the whole process. How do we get them? That has been the subject of my research and what's in the advanced cancer book, of course. We eat uh, Clostridium bacteria because they're everywhere in dirt, but we don't get sick from eating Clostridium in dirt. We, uh, we eat a common little parasite in dirt called rabbit fluke. It has a scientific name, too. Uh, and that rabbit fluke brings in Clostridium, sort of like the Trojan horse brought in soldiers. They are within. So after eating rabbit fluke with nearly all the food that you think is perfectly safe. Carrots? Root vegetables? Raw carrots, yes. Even cooked carrots, yes. Because uh, this parasite, the, the rabbit fluke, does not get killed by boiling temperatures. We test. Uh, all the food for our patients for three molds, zearalanone, patulin, and aflatoxin. I see those molds, that is the, the mycotoxins that they make, not the mold, growing mold itself. But the mycotoxins they make are dreadfully toxic, and I always see them in cancer patients right in the tumor. I'm not sure what the significance of that is, but when you find it's a common denominator for tumors, it does make you think it's important. And where does the patulin mold come from? Patulin is found in other fruits and, and plant materials too, but apples is where we get most of it. You can hardly peel an apple without seeing some mold under the peeling, and that will have patulin in it. Is that what we see in the brown spot? Yes. That's what the brown spot is. It isn't really a brown spot. It's a moldy spot. How do you suggest we prepare our fruit, and how, do, how should we eat it? Mostly don't eat it. Peel those fruits. Peel the potatoes. Peel the apples. Peel the pears. Peel the peaches. Peel everything, and then you'll be astounded at what you have been eating. What's your concern with the relationship with the pet and, and the sick patient? Pet dander and pet saliva and, and, and pet filth gets into everything in the room. I have tested dust from, from the room of a, of a home where there was a pet, let's say just a cat, much as I love cats, uh, or a dog, and there are asterisk eggs everywhere and tapeworm eggs everywhere, on the tabletop, on the kitchen counter, on the chairs, anywhere you want to take a dust sample. And why wouldn't there be? Our dander is everywhere, and our germs are everywhere. Why wouldn't theirs be? And what do these two parasites do to the body? They are very injurious. Ascaris does some of the most damaging things to us, causes our seizures, causes our uh, very many brain disorders. About three or four years ago, I guess it was four years ago, Lisa started having, having seizures. Uh, the seizures were, um, they covered pretty much a, a wide range of different types of seizures. Uh, they cover different areas of her body, which to the doctors basically indicated um, a non-epileptic seizure. Uh, she went through EEG, several different doctors. Anyways, um, uh, I was referred to Dr. Clark. This is when I actually initially heard of her. And a uh, uh, treatment she used for seizures, which was black walnut. Um, we tried her on the black walnut after um, not wanting her to go on other drugs for uh, negative side effects and the black walnut worked so we oh, kept her on that and when you start taking the black walnut did you instantly get results uh about five days later my seizures like stopped i'll have one like now at once maybe every two months one day.
you're a clinical dietitian. Yes, now I work with my husband in his office and we follow Dr. Clark's protocol. So, all the way over here in Italy, you're following Dr. Clark's protocol. Why are you using her specific protocol? Well, we've used a lot of protocols. Uh, uh, my husband is doing orthomolecular medicine here in Italy. He's the president of the International Association for Orthomolecular Medicine here. And we've seen many kind of medicines. Uh, he knows Ayurvedic medicine, Tibetan medicine, and uh, vitamins, minerals, uh, amino acids, of course, all those kind of things. Uh, vitamin C from Linus Pauling teachings and everything and lately we've discovered Dr. Clark's protocol and we've seen that it's very very effective we are helping people to heal by cancer yes we have several people utilizing the principle by Dr. Lisa Clark uh, the black walnut the vitamin C the antioxidation and the alkalinity diet the alkalizing diet and uh, we have found very good results and people you know when you increase the level of electron inside the cell when you stabilize the cell with the uh, proper fatty acids when you teach the people how to get better just avoiding the old mistakes cancer is no more mm, necessary what have you seen so far with uh, working with cancer patients and dr. Clark's formulas great results great recoveries and I can say it because I'm not a medical doctor with my husband <laughs> as my husband is so I can be more sincere with you and because you know medical doctors also in Italy they have to stay aware of the of, of the government so is there a legal problem with saying that you actually cure cancer yes of course there is yes you cannot say you cure cancer he was uh, called by the government once and they told him you know dr Pamphili, you're, you're very famous but you must watch out because you cannot say that uh, you cure cancer and he said but i never did they told him, but there is a pa there some patients of you going around saying they've been cured, they were sick and now they healed, so how is it possible? So he said, they said it, I didn't say it, I mean, that's possible. Okay, but you know, the work of a doctor uh, is more of a... Um, of a writing work, you know, you have to prescribe, you don't have to go on alternative medicine, you don't have to look so more, uh, so far, uh, just, you know, prescribe drugs, don't worry. For those people that are obviously going to be your critics because you use a very powerful word in your book, in the title to your new book, Cure to All Advanced Stages of Cancer. Yes. Perhaps you could elaborate on the word cure and help us to understand why you've chosen such a powerful word. The word cure is, is an accurate word. I chose it because it was the correct description of what I was pursuing. So now for those people that have cancer, we're in the second week of the healing process, heading for the third week. We've rounded the corner. You must be excited at this part in the healing process when you're getting to work with the patient. What do you see? At the end of the first week, we have cleaned up the tissues so thoroughly that we can afford to try to open the tumors. You see what's in the tumor is still everything that you got out of the rest of your tissues. You may have gotten rid of all the parasites, all the bacteria, all the heavy metals, plasticizers, solvents, everything you have cleaned up in the first week but it's all still there in the tumors. Is it your suggestion then that you've already stopped the malignancy so the cancer can't now kill you? Oh, we do that in the first day. In the first day? Yes, we just give uh, a dose, a large dose of green black walnut hull. And what does that do? That, that kills the stages, larval stages of the fasciolopsis parasite called the intestinal fluke. And that's the only single thing that causes malignancy? That is the only thing that I have found so far over five years of studying possibly two to three thousand patients. All cancer? Yes. So we... There may be other, there may be other things 
and other scientists can search for them, but I haven't found them. Why have no other researchers found this? They haven't looked. So we've stopped the malignancy, we're in the second week, and now you're attacking the tumor. What specific nutritional supplements do you like to do that with? Well, we have only found one way of reliably popping open the tumors. And of course, we didn't want to do it too soon. If the body is not ready, if the liver isn't ready to take that huge dose of aflatoxin and azo dye that's going to come out of those tumors, you have done a lot of damage, the patient may die from the toxicity of opening the tumors. Now these tumors were caused by the aflatoxin and the dye that we talked about earlier. And other things, right. So over a lifetime, this is accumulated and we've got tumors. Right. How it forms, I've discussed somewhat in the book. We have a fairly good insight on how it actually forms into a tumor. But regardless, once, once you have a toxic collection, it's like having uh, garbage, uh, garbage piles in your house safely closed. Now, if you need to clean up the house, are you going to just open those garbage dumps? No that could make a much worse mess than you had before. Let's talk about the azo dye before we continue. Where do you get azo dye? Azo dyes used to be used as food colors in the past. And what products? Very many products. For instance, margarine. Yes, they used to use an azo dye called diamino azo benzene, DAB for short. Still today? Oh no, no. They're carcinogenic potential was recognized by the 50s and even early and legislation was passed not allowing azo dyes in hardly any food at least not the carcinogenic azo dyes some dyes are still allowed maybe two or three in jelly beans jello of course candies and, and, and many other connections so if they if they outlawed it in the 50s how are we seeing cancer today and tumors especially today that is a very puzzling question it certainly puzzled me and must puzzle anybody who is told that very fact it comes in through pollution of the uh, manufacturing process a manufacturing process just cannot be that careful now I believe that the actual route of pollution is regular chlorine bleach because I find sodium hypochlorite in all foods and materials that have azo dye pollution. But we do not have the proof for that. And we have tried to find uh, a way of testing it, but there are no labs that and I was able to find that could test for these azo dyes at, these le at, at any level. They're not accustomed to looking for azo dyes in foods because they're assumed not to exist. Does your synchrometer find azo dyes? Oh, yes. So that's I have a, a set of 18. And I find that they all coexist, especially the two very, very damaging ones that are DAB that I mentioned to you and another one called Sudan Black B. The reason I consider these the most damaging is because they're the last to leave when we draw them out of your body. And when they leave, when the dab is out of your body, as testing, by the, testing with the synchrometer, the alkaline phosphatase level drops to normal in your blood test. Very many people die of a high alkaline phosphatase level. So this is, an important, their bones. this is an important marker for you when you're looking at cancer patients. Oh, yes. And the other dye, Sudan Black B, when we get that one out, and it takes longer because it's right inside the nucleus and, in, and uh, it's very hard to pull out. Where do you find Sudan Black B? Along with the other azo dyes, polluting everything that's on the market that's processed. So the outlook looks bleak, but perhaps you could give us a list of healthy products that we can choose in the book. I have listed a lot of healthy products and, and how to choose is perhaps a better, easier for, for the public. public.
Yeah, I came across Dr. Clark about four years ago, and I realized that it's really important that this knowledge is being used and applied uh, so that people are really getting uh, better. So I started the Dr. Clark Research Association, and uh, I'm promoting Dr. Clark in seminars, uh, in lectures, and we're also about to set up a clinic in Switzerland so that we can apply her protocol. We have, especially in Germany and in Switzerland, a lot of therapists in the, um, in the alternative medical field who are using it, plus a lot of uh, medical doctors as well. Especially in Italy, we see the trend that medical doctors are using uh, these therapies. What kind of results are you getting with treating cancer? Since I work so closely with a lot of therapists, I, I can see results almost every day. Not all of them about cancer, but incredible cases like uh, people who have only days to go and they get well. Now, I know you're working on um, coming up with body care chemicals specifically to help us get better. Um, um, skin lotions and even toothpaste and hair dye. That's interesting to me because your hair is not tr the traditional color. Uh, what are you using for your hair dye? I'm doing experiments on hair dyes and that's why you see it purple on one day, slate on another day, more blue on another day, and maybe more red on another day. I'm trying to develop safe hair dyes because I consider it such a tragedy that all the hair dyes on the market have azo dyes in them perhaps even legitimately, because it isn't controlled by the FDA. So this could be a huge source of cancer problem. A problems. very huge source. Now you might think, well, the hair is growing out of you. How could that, you know, penetrate? It does. As soon as you've hair dyed, we see the dyes in the scalp, the fat of the scalp. The dye is fat soluble. It goes right into the fat of the scalp, and there it sits in our, as a reservoir for about six weeks. By then you're doing it again. And from there, the dye has to be relocated to the liver, and then it goes to all the, to your tumors and then your other problem organs. And there's no reason that couldn't be easily cleaned up. So that's been one of my dedications to find a safe hair dye. And this happens to be uh, a Dahlia black henna. In your suggestion of cleaning up the environment in the home, how do you suggest we clean up the environment in our personal care products? Don't use them. You can't clean them up. They're all polluted. From toothpaste to shampoo, you name it, it's all polluted. That's why the first thing we do, and in fact on the day one of our 21-day program, you, you throw away, you don't just set aside because you'll never use it again. You just throw away all your, your products for your skin, your hair, whatever. Why, why do we have to throw away those products? They're all polluted. They, most of them have isopropyl alcohol in them and azo dyes and uh, they also have um, heavy metal pollution. It's, it's shocking. Fantastic. Uh, one more question. In your book, Cure to Cancer, you specifically talk about isopropyl alcohol, which we also know to be rubbing alcohol. Yes. How is it possible that something so toxic is being used in such a wide variety of commercial products from our shampoo to our hair conditioners to our skin care products and to even toothpaste. And without even noticing that it's doing anything, right? Yes. We've been using it probably for 50 years, maybe more. I remember my father using it, buying a bottle of it as part of an aftershave. I think that it's Toxicity is so subtle because it causes mutations. I discover the mutations with a synchrometer. It forms isopropyl complexes with our nucleic acids. I don't know if anyone has looked for them, but the names for the compounds are very long, so I don't want to bore you with them. And, uh, it also combines with our vitamin C, isopropyladene ascorbate. So perhaps, and this of course should get some good biochemical attention from regular biochemistry, perhaps uh, isopropyl alcohol uh, depletes your system of ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Um, with relationship to other disease, you've covered that in your other books. Where do you see allergies fitting into all of this? 
it's a very important uh, disorder that we have. Liver dysfunction. It's a loose concept because we all have a small degree of liver dysfunction. But the prevalence of allergies now, and especially what we call environmentally sensitive people or multiple allergies, that is very significant. It should be as a bugle call to us. Hey, look, something is happening to your liver. The liver can no longer detoxify a large number of chemicals that you are getting into you, and you better not do that. Allergy, we could say, is a kind of a civilization uh, sickness. So we read a lot of clinic reports that um, Indians in the jungle or somewhere don't have any allergies. And so it is very clear that uh, civilization bring allergy with it. And the experience we have is that people start allergies um, with one or two allergies. And sometimes it's not that uh, uh, harmful. But after years go by, which means that um, parasites can develop, uh, they can have more toxins in the body, then uh, they develop more and more allergies. It's very interesting that in Europe there's a high acceptance for natural and herbal remedies. More and more people uh, are trying to get well on a uh, natural way because they see the limits of the uh, highly toxic chemical treatments that we see. What other diseases are you seeing cured? We see very fast cures in diabetes. Uh, we see people get negative with uh, HIV. And basically, on the very simple things, I had a wart myself behind the ear, I zapped, and it fell off. You have an interesting treatment that you suggest in your book called the liver flush. And what is the relationship with the liver flush and what we're talking about here for purging the body of bacteria? It does purge the body of bacteria very nicely. I don't incorporate it in the 21-day program because the patients are too sick to be going through a liver flush. They can do that after they get a little better. But in the uh, book Cure for Cancers, which is for earlier cancer stages, uh, and, and the other books where people are just ill of other diseases, cleaning the liver is probably the most effective thing they can do to get immediate relief of many pains and many problems, say a digestion problem. Pain in the shoulder is very, very typically improved the very next day. Did you invent this liver flush? No, I didn't. I only uh, experimented with it uh, repeatedly to develop something that was reliable so that if anybody did it, say a hundred people, at least 99 of them would get stones out. Now you say stones, I mean pebbles like we see on the beach? Sometimes they're pebbles like you see on the beach, small gray very hard rocks, but most of the time they're larger, green-colored, roundish objects, uh, the size of a bean or a pea or a lima bean, and sometimes much, much larger. Could we see these with an ultrasound or an MRI no, or an X-ray? No, you can't because they don't have that much density difference from your tissue. To be able to see something, say, on X-ray, it would have to be calcified. And on an ultrasound it would ha or a scan, it would have to have quite a density difference, and it doesn't. It's really just made of cholesterol crystals, garbage, and mush. <laughs> As part of Dr. Clark's program, she encourages the liver flush. And in my nutritional consulting practice, I've been doing the liver flush for a number of years. Dr. Clark has helped me to even perfect it to a greater level. The liver flush has been a popular remedy for flushing the liver, the colon, as well as the kidney for a number of years. In fact, it dates back more than 2,000 years ago. The Egyptians were actually doing it, where the um, Egyptians would travel across the desert, get the salt out of the Dead Sea. They would bring it back and they would put it into the kings with a combination of lemon and sea salt, and they would flush the liver this way. Well, we have a more sophisticated way of doing it now, using Epsom salt, olive oil, and grapefruit as the grand finale, and we'll just show you how we build up to it to prepare the body so that the body can eliminate some of the toxins. The first thing we use is a beet cucumber juice, 
here. And the beet cucumber juice helps to um, alkalize the body as well as clean the liver. And then we also use black cherry juice, which helps both eating the cherries and drinking the juice to cleanse the kidney. And then in addition to that, for cleansing the kidney, we also use a tea made from uva ursi. Now we also use, for both the kidney and the liver, a combination of apple and lemon. And to that we add ginger. The reason why we suggest the ginger, the apple, and the lemon is because it really does help to emulsify the stones. So if you do this 21 days prior to the actual flush itself, you will emulsify a lot of these crystals that can accumulate in the liver. In fact, we actually use this formula of apple, lemon, and ginger as the first drink after the liver flush just to help get rid of some of the toxins and clear the liver of any extra crystals that might not have come out in the liver flush itself. Dr. Clark has found that this combination of black walnut and super blend of wormwood combination and cloves kills the parasite, the specific Fasciolopsis buski. And the best method for cleaning out the liver is to go in and use these products first for the first three weeks and then on the day of the flush you stop using all of these products and then you just go straight to the vegetable juices. And by the way, on that day, stay completely vegetarian and stay off of all the fats that particular day as well. So you'll build up the bile pressure in the liver and you'll get a more effective flush. In the digestive tract, she suggests that we use betaine HCL. So that helps drive all the bacteria down into the lower intestine where it can live there out of harm's way. And then in the teeth, she suggests that we brush our teeth with the oil of oregano. And the way we do that, Jane, if I could just have your hand here for a second, we just put a little dab on the finger, about, about that much, a drop. Then you take the toothbrush, like this, and you rub it on the, on the finger, absorbing all of the oregano oil. This is very, very hot, hotter than cayenne pepper, actually. And then you just go about brushing your teeth with it, which Jane can do now because she's preparing for her liver flush. You brush your teeth with it, and that kills all the clostridium bacteria in the teeth, preparing the liver then for the flush itself. To do the flush, what we normally do is we stop eating at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Now at that point, we allow the body four hours to get all of the food through the digestive tract. Then we introduce the body at 6 o'clock to the first glass of Epsom salt, which we have here, just regular Epsom salt, and about a tablespoon and a half in one glass. Now inside this glass of, of water, we've dissolved one and a half tablespoons of Epsom salt, and she'll do that at 6 o'clock. Then the second glass of water is also one and a half tablespoons of Epsom salt that she does two hours later at 8 o'clock. Now in between these two times, it's not mandatory, but it does help to do a foot massage, which you can use on a foot, mas foot massage machine, or you can just have your spouse or your, your mate um, give you a foot massage. It would really help to uh, sit in a chair with your feet elevated at least to allow the lymphatic system to, to cleanse itself. Now at the same time, I suggest you prepare two other glasses of eight ounces of water each with one and a half tablespoons of Epsom salt in both that you'll lay by the bedside and one will be drank at 6 a.m. in the morning and the other one will be drank at 8 o'clock in the morning when you'll get out of bed. So the first Epsom salt Jane does at 6 o'clock, the second Epsom salt she does at 8 o'clock and then two are prepared for 6 a.m. in the morning and 8 a.m. respectively so once she wakes up in the morning the Epsom salt is going to help encourage the bowel to eliminate. The reason why uh, Dr. Clark has picked Epsom salts of course is because the magnesium sulfate helps relax the, the liver and the bowel so that the stones can roll out easier. Sure. Her body's now prepared to take the liver flush itself, which is a combination of olive oil and freshly squeezed grapefruit juice. And we just use a regular citrus juicer for this. And usually you get about um, between two and three grapefruits should give you about eight ounces of grapefruit juice. And that's all you need to do this. The grapefruit juice, of course, that we get is pink and we filter it to make sure that there's no pulp and then in combination with the olive oil, it perfectly prepares the liver so that you can eliminate. Now as an option, and it's a very good option, we suggest that you ozonate the olive oil 
and we'll show you how to do that. You just get a regular ozonator. You can get this down at your local pet store because they use them for fish tanks and a regular fish tank pump here. Um, it's very, very cheap to get one of these and you can just put the ozonating ball right into the olive oil and then I plug it in. I don't suggest that you actually plug it in until you're ready to go because the ozone can be toxic in your environment. So now the ozone is going into the olive oil and it creates a very, very toxic formula for microorganisms, but it's not harmful to human health. So when we mix this together in combination with the grapefruit juice, this will force all of the bile salts and all of the chemical that's accumulated in the liver completely out in the morning. We suggest that you ozonate for approximately 10 minutes. That'll be enough to saturate it. As another option in helping to um, kill the microorganisms, Dr. Clark has created a product she calls the Synchro Zap or a Zapper and it works by sending electrical frequency into the body. And it's only run off of a 9 volt battery which you can see in the back here. And it's harmless to the body. And all you do is you I'll have Jane hold this one. You just wet, wet it down, put it on the little electrode here. So you just place it over the pulse point and snap it on and it's that simple. And the little electrode just snaps on and off on this snap. And then we do the other one the exact same way. Get a little bit wet so you've got conductivity. You don't even actually feel this when it's going on the body. Place it over the pulse point. Just turn it on by pushing the button. And it works in a, in a cycle of seven minutes, and then it takes a 20 minute rest. Then it repeats for seven minutes, and it takes another 20 minute rest. Then it repeats for seven more minutes. For the first seven minutes, it'll kill the parasite. And if anything should be living in the parasite, like a bacteria, then the next seven minutes will kill the bacteria. And if a virus should be living inside the bacteria, the following seven minutes should clean all of that up as well. And that's the uh, principle behind this device. Like I said, this is optional, but we do find that it does help with the uh, effectiveness of the flush. And that is the liver flush. The liver cleanse is much underestimated. It should be done a lot more often because it's, it's one of the most important parts of the protocol. You, because uh, a, especially cancer patients are highly toxic and they need a liver that's in a good shape to get rid of all these toxins. Doctor, if we read the back of many toothpastes that are available today in the grocery store, it says if we should swallow more than what you could fit on the end of the toothbrush, call poison control immediately. Perhaps you'd like to address that. I haven't actually seen that myself, but of course I feel that way. I know that. Uh, toothpaste is very toxic stuff. Not just because of the chemicals in it, but because the material in it is ground so fine that a few should get some into an extraction site where a tooth once was, it will stay there forever. I find toothpaste in old extraction sites that never heal, they're called cavitations, I talk about that in the book. Cavitations where old tooth extractions have left an area of well, minor infection, it becomes a bioaccumulation site and there's toothpaste in there. There's a lot of silicone in toothpaste and silicone is absorbed, taken in by the white blood cells and, and white blood cells become disabled by it. Now, that's called low immunity, immune dysfunction. Coming from your toothpaste, that's awful. Well, oddly enough, um, I was uh, on the staff of UCLA uh, back in the 60s, and I gave the first class at UCLA, because one of my jobs at UCLA was to develop the curriculum for the uh, new students coming aboard and also the dental school itself. And so I, I was um, fortunate to, begin, uh, to give the first lecture on mercury fillings that the students had. And in my research, I uncovered that mercury was a concern. In fact, in 19, uh, 1848, it was uh, considered illegal to use mercury, unethical. 
uh, the then union of, of uh, dentistry was the American College of Dental Surgeons, and it was like the analogous to the ADA. And that group of bodies said it was illegal or unethical to use mercury because of its toxic concerns. But then there was no alternative that, that was able to be used. So dentists got together and began using mercury fillings because it was more economical. And indeed, there was a serious problem because what are you going to use? You can't use gold. Most people couldn't afford gold. And even the gold techniques were not refined as they are today. So there was no option, no uh, alternative. Uh, so the, this group of dentists began to use mercury fillings. And that group grew and became the American Dental Association. So the American Dental Association has had its formation on the utilization of mercury fillings, which is ironic, of course. The American Dental Association suggests that silver fillings really don't have any ill effect on our health, but you've proven that that is not true. I wouldn't call them silver fillings. I would call them uh, mercury, thallium, and lanthanide fillings because they are not made of silver and mercury and iron and nickel, let's say. They are made of silver, mercury, iron, nickel, and all the other 70 elements in the table, including the very toxic ones, including even uranium. We are finding uranium in them. How more carcinogenic can it get? And it gets out. That's the point. I think that the uh, Dental Association is not aware and hasn't done the experiments to, to find out, is not aware that the metals from these fillings, including uranium, are, can be found in the kidneys, the liver, the spleen, and other organs. Wherever your tumor is, that's where it's bioaccumulating. There was a body of evidence that would say, hey, you're, you're using this potentially lethal material while dentists were, were teaching, and I was one of the ones who were taught, who then taught that mercury was inert when you mixed with silver, tin, zinc, and copper, of which consists of the mercury filling or the amalgam or the silver filling. It's really a mercury filling because 50% of it's mercury. And if you mix it with silver, tin, zinc, and copper, we taught that it was inert, which is a scientific impossibility because everything by the laws of entropy is in the process of decay. And in the case of the dental mercury filling, the decay is quite, uh, quite prominent. For those people watching this video that have already changed their tooth fillings from the mercury filling to the white fillings, what about that? I have to apologize for that. That's what I said in the first book, Cure for All Cancers, that that's what you should do. At that time, I was not aware that they were seeping carcinogenic dyes. I, I don't think any scientist anywhere could ever imagine that a perfectly white tooth, a white cap, should be tested for carcinogenic dyes that are red. But all the dyes are polluted with the other dyes. And all the materials that are used for the manufacture of these synthetic uh, plastic teeth are polluted with synthetic dyes. We, we test for 18 azo dyes. These azo dyes cause the well-known P53 mutations. And for those people that don't know what a P53 mutation is? All tumors, cancerous tumors, uh, are loaded with mutations. This means chromosome breaks and gene mutations. That's why you do a biopsy and send it to the lab. The cytologist in the lab looks at the slides and when they see these mutations, chromosomes all over the place, they can designate what kind of cancer you have. That is the clue to the fact that there is cancer going on in that biopsy. So your research has proven that a healthy cell is turning into a cancerous cell because of the dye. Exactly. That's part of it. It's more complicated than that, but that is a very big part. And we cannot stop the tumor from growing, and we can't, uh, we can't start it shrinking unless you stop giving it dyes, carcinogenic dyes. In fact, in the, in the average mouth, we might find sometimes 26 different metals in the mouth, which again, not only is biocompatible problem with toxicities, but the electronics. This has been a fascinating field for, for us in the last 15 years. We've been doing electronic readings uh, by using a, an amp meter, uh, a more sophisticated digital amp meter. 
Well, if we have teeth now that have metal in their mouth that are constantly generating electricity. And by the way, our car battery is a lead pole and a zinc pole and a box of sulfuric acid, right? If we wanted to create the quintessential battery, we would use gold and silver, the cathode and the anode, the positive and the negative pole, which can create a wonderful battery. Well, we do this in the mouth. So tremendous amounts of electricity can disturb the normal flow of ionic flow in the body. So if you've got a constant flow of electricity created by the metal fillings in our, in our mouth, we can then turn off, or the body says, hey, the stimulation is constant. I better do something to adapt. So it blocks instead of stimulates like the initial acupuncture needle is stimulated, but if left in there, it could cause a problem. Our teeth are those bioelectrical electrodes, and I refer to them sometimes as spark plugs because they have capacity. The, the tooth, incidentally, the tooth is a very interesting device because it's surrounded by crystal. And the crystal, if we look at what the computer is all about, the computer has its heart in the silicone chip. It has the crystal of the silicone chip. And the analogous of the silicone chip in the computer is the enamel that covers this, this thing we call the tooth. So the, in a normal, healthy tooth, the tooth has capacity to hold a charge, like the spark plug has a capacity to hold a charge. But if you put metal in that tooth, you disturb this electronic flow. And so a whole vast of things are now being looked at related to this electrical disturbance that you you make mention of, and rightly so. See in the in the X-ray, these teeth that are marked out are the ones that have silver fillings in them. Now they're they're uh, as you can see, well, we'll see just a bit in the mouth. They are decayed already. They start to uh, to leak, and these are full of bacteria. And the bacteria starts to fester in his mouth, and then it'll start to spread all through his whole body. So what we have here, is you can see. Some of the mercury and uh, amount and some of the silver filling in there that it's oxidizing and it's seeping into the body. And we'll, if we have micro leakage, you want to see how far you can jump? Okay. Well, in this area there, he's already got some micro leakage and Clostridium bacteria is going under there and it festers in there and that creates, well, an infectious site. And if they, if you have uh, bacteria in there, it'll start to, to go down into your tooth, and that'll go into your blood system, and then it'll harbor somewhere and create a larger problem. Like a tumor. It could go into a tumor. Why are no other dentists um, doing this type of extraction procedure? Well, from what I've talked to Dr. Clark, uh, her theory is not, well, it's not a theory, her method is not well received by uh, mainstream dentistry or mainstream medicine. Uh, there's a lot of things that are not well seen by mainstream uh, medical practice. Why do you guys see it? Well, the arguments that Dr. Clark told us uh, were very convincing. And uh, some of the things we have seen through her method are well, they're very blatant. You can't really ignore them. So you actually see the bacteria under the Well, no, you don't see bacteria, because the bacteria is microscopic. But you see the, the benefits that it, has been, that it produces. So you actually see patients getting well after the teeth are removed? They're getting a lot better. Well, we're, you know, we're, we're talking in general today about controversial subjects, right? And certainly root canal fillings are extreme controversy. And uh, 
there's been a lot of concerns about the root canal. They're all, and it's not just recent. Uh, Dr. Alfred Price uh, really was one of the pioneers in the concern of root canals. He was a past president of the American Dental Association and a tremendous researcher and a humanitarian and a, a, a nutritionist. Um, he said that basically what he had found in his early studies is that he would take an extracted root canal tooth and take some of that grindings and put it underneath the rabbit's ear. And he would find that, that if the patient, the donor from that tooth, let's say had a strep bacteria, that patient, that rabbit then would mimic or would develop the same kind of infection. So he found that there was bacteria present uh, in a dead tooth living in the tubules themselves. A, a vital tooth, a healthy vital tooth, uh, is made up of a canal on the inside with various um, blood vessels and nerves radiating inside the chamber of that tooth. And uh, radiating from uh, these, this canal are little tubules, microscopic little tubules in the dentin underneath this cap of enamel I mentioned earlier, that <clears throat> little tubules uh, allow the fluid to come in and out of that tooth, balancing the hydrostatic pressure within that chamber so that when there's swelling inside the tooth, we see a, a, we see a fluid coming out the tooth. Otherwise, we'd have a toothache all the time. So this, uh, this exchange of fluids throughout the tubules in a healthy tooth is there for a reason. When we do a root canal filling, we take out, we take out all the uh, canal, all the dead tissue. In the case of uh, a dead tooth, uh, we were to assume that if a tooth died, we would simply remove the nerves and the blood vessels and the abscess and all the dead tissue that was related to a dead tooth and fill it in with a suitable filling material. Now, assuming that filling material is suitable, Dr. Price showed that within these tubules that were once occupied by fluid, now they have become dehydrated and then they become inhabited by microorganisms. Why do you have to extract a root canal? Because wherever there is foreign material in a tooth socket, which is way down deep in your tissue, Clostridium bacteria find that location and they grow there. So it isn't, in this case, a matter of what the composition is. It's the fact that it gets infected and you don't know it. You don't feel pain. You don't, you're not alerted to it. And the Clostridium bacteria find it a home because it's anaerobic. What's the problem when people extract the teeth and they don't pull that ligament out? Well. Uh, according to Dr. Clark, everything in this area has already been infected. And if you leave part of the tissue that's infected, uh, it'll still fester in there. It'll still be contaminated. The reason for this is that although you do get a lot of bleeding, the, the bone in that area is not as, well, it doesn't have as much circulation because it's a thicker type of bone. It's more of a... Uh, of a cortical type of bone that goes into that area. Now, this cortical bone is thicker, it's denser, so it has less less circulation. Unless that is scraped off uh, accordingly, and some of that bone that, that seems to be contaminated, taken out till we leave a, a nice big uh, bloody mess. <laughs> An open cavity, so it can yeah, heal better. So it'll, so it'll heal better. And this is what she calls the Archega method in her new book. Oh, I haven't read her new book yet. I cannot wait. Look at that, Chris. This is the top part of the back here. Look at that bacteria. That is black. All that black. There's, there's the old filling. See that? Gosh, look how poisonous that is. Wow. I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll. I'm, I'm, I'm now 37 years old, and I've had these fillings since I was 13. And I've constantly been fighting with an immune system breakdown, and I've always had little growth growing in my lymph system. And most recently, I've had this tumor 
on my breast, and I couldn't get it to go away, constantly fighting with bacteria growing there, specifically the uh, colostridium. So after consulting with Dr. Clark, she said the only thing to do is to really pull the teeth. The fillings were so big that I couldn't risk trying to drill them out and poison myself with even the slightest amount of the mercury. And now that we can see what actually came out, it was even more toxic than we thought. And to be honest with you, I think this procedure was actually easier than uh, going in with a drill and drilling and trying to replace the filling. And to date, there really isn't anything to replace the fillings with that um, isn't toxic. So um, for the sake of saving my life, I think this was a much better procedure. And uh, I'll just get some partial and put them back there and uh, continue on with my, uh, with my healthy lifestyle. So all this research that you've done over this past number of years, you funded yourself? Yes. And in doing so, how were you compensated? By the knowledge, I suppose. So you do this out of the goodness of your heart, not looking for compensation financially, but you have a true passion for finding the cure to all disease. Well, at least cancer and AIDS. Again, thank I can't you. cope with all the rest of it. Others will, now that we have a technology that can do it. But I thought that I should be uh, focused on cancer and AIDS since, since there is so much suffering there.